All right, here we go. Let's see, let me get you coordinated here a little bit. All right, what do you think? See, it's okay. Do you see the picture of Dr. John McDougall there taking care of patients? Yep. All right, well, that, that's really what I love to do best is to, to, to you know, touch people, to talk to people, to give a chance to make a positive difference in their lives. And so I wanna, I wanna kind of talk to you about how I got to where I am today. And I have to describe myself as the luckiest doctor in the world. And the reason is, AJ, is because my patients get well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it used to be for me, which is just to hand out a bunch of pills and give people a bunch of excuses as to why they're sick and none have ever made sense. You know, I've had the, the opportunity to have the most powerful medicine there is, which is food. You know, I know it took a big step for me to, to stand up and say, it's the food, but it's the food. So let me spend a little time telling you about how I got here. I, I did uh, part of my medical school training at the uh, Blodgett Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where I met Mary. I met her in an operating room. Uh, she was a surgical nurse and I as a medical student assisted on surgery and we teamed up together pinning a hip one day. You know, I, I only saw her, her in a mask and I know that's common these days, but I only saw her in a mask and just seeing her eyes and the rest of her, I fell in love with her right there in the operating room. But anyway, it took her a, while, a long time before she could say the same thing, I wanna tell you. Anyway, uh, we decided that, uh, that we were gonna to be together and six weeks later we got engaged and six weeks later we got married. But you know, that's okay, AJ, because my parents raised me to understand how to make the right choices. They said, first of all, John, you must you must be honest with yourself. And when you meet the woman that you love, you'll know. And the second thing she said, AJ, she said, you, you have to find a happy person to be with because you're never gonna make them happy. And I could have taken that personally, you know? But the truth is, is that people are as they are. You can't change them. And so I had a chance to meet Mary. And uh, at about the same time, in fact, it was my senior year of medical school, it was about in December of 1971. I went to a noontime conference and I met this man who changed my life. You know, prior to that, I was a very frustrated medical student. I couldn't really see myself as a doctor because well, I've learned about a bunch of genetic issues and a bunch of symptoms and signs and like I say, excuses and a pill for this and a pill for that. But I, I never had anybody talk about what really caused illness and how to get people well until this man showed up at uh, my noontime conference, conference at Blodgett Medical Center. He was there to visit uh, Kellogg Cereal Company in Battle Creek, Michigan, because he was a believer in fiber. And of course, there's lots of fiber in cereals. And he wanted to tell the Kellogg's people to put more fiber in your cereal. Well, he stopped by and he gave this lecture and he talked about his experiences that are just amazing. He uh, grad graduated from a surgical training program in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he, with a bunch of his buddies, Troll, Walker, uh, Sheev, they, 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 uh, they went to Africa after their graduation. And they went to the country of Uganda to help the people in Uganda. And uh, Dennis Burkett came back and told me about his experiences in Uganda. He spent 17 years there. He took care of... Uh, oversaw more than 10 million people, a, a thousand hospitals he was in charge in of, and, and he was the head of ministries of health in Uganda for this 17 year period of time. And he told me in this noontime conference, and AJ, as far as I was concerned, he was just talking to me. He told me that the people in Uganda, the 10 million people, they never had hemorrhoids, colon cancer, pulmonary embolus, deep vein thrombosis, they were never overweight. They never had breast cancer, colon cancer, or prostate cancer. He saw one case of gallbladder disease in 17 years, and he saw one heart attack. And this was in a judge who trained in London and came back to Uganda and had a heart attack. Well, the people in Uganda ate a starch-based diet, a, based, uh, a diet based on, on starches, grains, and, and uh, tubers, and vegetables, and almost no meat at all. And so Dennis Burke had told me this and uh, the experience was, was amazing. It was life changing. I, I remember coming home after this lecture and telling Mary, 
you know, I just heard this amazing lecture on the importance of fiber. And from now on, Mary, we're not going to eat any more white bread in our home. We're only eating, eating brown bread with our bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. <laughs> so we threw the white bread out. And that's the only change. We didn't give up the meat, the dairy, or anything after that lecture. That, that was the only thing that we were. But our eyes were opened. It wasn't until I came back from 20 years surgical practice in Africa that I was helped largely by others to appreciate that most of the common chronic diseases filling the hospital beds in Western countries today are rare or unknown in the third world, were rare even in North America before the First World War, are equally common in Black and White Americans, and therefore they have to be due to our lifestyle, the way we live, and in which case they've got to be preventable if we can identify the factors in our lifestyle. So uh, Dennis Burkett said something that should be really obvious to all of us, and that is that we contact our environment. And that's how we either stay healthy or we become diseased. We contact our environment in three ways. The air, which is you know, basically oxygen and carbon dioxide and some nitrogen and some contamination. Not, not many different kinds of molecules and not very many molecules in terms of numbers. And water, which is basically H2O and a few contaminants. And again, very few molecules in terms of the impact of food, which is tens of thousands of different molecules in vastly greater numbers. And so we, when we talk about environmental diseases, diseases that vary around the world, we look at the, what they eat. That's the strongest contact with people's environment. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world who don't get the common diseases in Western culture, and when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, diverticular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet that's far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. Uh, Dr. Dr. Burkett, he mentioned in this uh, particular article, he, he, in this lecture, he mentioned the word starch, uh, which is, uh, let me see if I can get this. There's the book, there's the starch he mentioned, he talked about. And that's you know why I named the last book, the book I published in 2012, The Starch Solution, because that's the correct terminology for rice and corn and potatoes, no matter how much that word has been maligned, that's what we used to call the kind of foods that we're supposed to be eating. But that, that nomenclature was taken away from us by industry. Instead, they ask us to call starch complex carbohydrates. Well, how can you identify a complex carbohydrate on your plate? You know, how, how can you pick one out of your garden? You've got to use words that are familiar, starches, and that Hopefully, we can get that terminology back. All right. Uh, Dr. Burkett, he showed one slide that was really important. And uh, when he talked about, uh, about the hospitals and the diseases, and what he did is he showed this particular slide that I remember. Uh, it is uh, two frames that demonstrate something really important. And he said that, based on this slide, when you look around the world, what you find is that populations that have small bowel movements have big hospitals. And populations who have big bowel movements have small hospitals. I hope you can make the connection. Well, you see, I spent years recognizing the fiber related to bowel behavior, recognizing that in people who had adequate bowel behavior, they virtually never had a lot of our Western diseases. And I really copied the example of my friend Alec Walker in South Africa, who has looked at thousands of students. But you see, now we know from the evidence available that the average American who isn't a vegetarian only passes about 80 to 130 grams of stool a day. In people 
people with and elderly people under 50. And whereas in countries that don't have bowel cancer, breast cancer, gallstones, coronary heart disease, so on, they pass three to five hundred grams of stool a day. And I think we are genetically, as it were, coded up or made to get on with far more fiber than we take. And I think our relationship to, because there was always causative relationship, but our relationship to a lot of our Western diseases is related to what I might call our national constipation. Just to be practical in terms of everyday foods that people yeah. eat, can you name a few foods that you'd like to see people eat more of? Oh yes, oh yes. I think we ought to eat far more foods made of cereals in dinner, particularly bread. Our ancestors ate between a pound, about a pound and a quarter per head per day of bread, all with brown flour. We in Europe, in England, eat under a quarter of a pound a day. I think bread is a, a brown bread, not white bread. Brown or wholemeal bread is a very healthy diet. I'd like to see. Now, peas and beans are extraordinarily good because they're high in soluble fiber, which is good from the point of view of diabetes and coronary heart disease. I think potatoes are very good. They're high in potassium. And Western man is the only mammal alive who eats more uh, sodium than potassium. I think potatoes, as long as they are neither cooked or eaten with fat, are a slimming diet, they're very nutritious. They tell me that there's almost no other diet which came, contains almost <coughs> everything a human being uh, needs. You know, you're talking about a vegetarian diet. Now, say we consider the ideal diet a vegetarian diet. Can you think of any reasons to add meat to that diet? No, no need, no need. How about no. dairy products? Any reason to add dairy well, products? Well, some that? people would say that if you add dairy products, you're, you've got to get your, you have your vitamin B12. You're less likely to get dishes in India. And see, there were relatively few in England vegans. There's a lot of vegetarians, but very few vegans. I don't think um, a vegetarian diet is a healthy diet. I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be authoritative to talk on the diet with no milk or eggs, but certainly a vegetarian diet can be a very, very healthy diet. It's been the diet of the, most of the Japanese throughout history, and they have the longest life expectancy of any country in the world. So you don't consider calcium an issue as far as dairy products? No, because the communities who don't drink milk at all after childhood suffer almost not at all from osteoporosis village. But you don't see people in an African village walking around with their chin on their chest from osteoporosis. And age adjusted, and Africans in South Africa have only one eleventh the risk of getting femoral neck fractures. And they have a lower calcium intake in their diet than we have. So whatever it is, I don't, I doubt whether taking calcium tablets really does much help. So uh, after, after my experiences with Dr. Or after my experiences at um, my medical school, you know, Mary and I decided that we were going to leave uh, Michigan and we went to Hawaii and I took uh, my internship, a surgical internship at the Queens Medical Center. And the Queens Medical Center really had a reputation for a surfing internship. It, it didn't really have a, a solid reputation, but you know, I got interested in in medicine. You know, after my plantation experience, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second. And you see here a, a, a picture of the Hawaii Medical Library. This is where I spent a good share of my residency training was in the Hawaii Medical Library. After a year of surgical internship, uh, Mary and I didn't want to leave Hawaii. You can just imagine, you know, two young people, the world right there in front of us, a beautiful place, paradise. We just didn't want to leave. And so I took a job as a sugar plantation doctor on the big, big island of Hawaii. And there I worked for three years and it changed my life. Uh, I learned a couple of really important things. One thing I learned was that what I was doing for people didn't work. People who had chronic diseases, I was making no positive difference in their lives. You know, I just gave them a bunch of pills and a bunch of excuses like every other doctor. Now I was doing some good. I don't want you to think that I was, this was a completely unrewarding experience, 
when people had acute problems like lacerations or infections or broken bones, I would intervene and I'd make a positive difference. But when it came to chronic diseases, like chronically obese, chronic cancers, chronic high blood pressure, chronic arthritis, I was making no difference at all. But the word chronic should have opened my eyes and realized that I wasn't going to make any difference. And so uh, it was a very frustrating experience. And, you know, quite honestly, I blame myself. I, I thought I was a terrible doctor. After all, I took this surfing internship at the Queens Medical Center. Maybe I didn't really learn how to be a good doctor. I mean, I knew what good doctors were supposed to do. I'd watched Ben Casey, Marcus Welby, and Dr. Kilder. And I knew the miracles that I was supposed to be delivering. And I wasn't delivering them. So that's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned from my plantation practice was that people eat differently. I was in a situation where, uh, where people were of several generations. They, they, we, I took care of first generation people who were folks that were raised in their native lands like uh, Japan and China and Korea and the Philippines. And then these first generation people, they moved to, uh, to Hawaii to start a new life on the sugar plantations. And with them, they took their basic eater, eating patterns. Uh, they'd learned a diet of rice and vegetables, no dairy products, very little meat, and that's the way they continued to eat. Now, they came to the Big Island. They had uh, children. The children were influenced by uh, Western living. And as a result, they changed their diet. And so the second generation got a little bigger, a little more overweight, a little sicker. And by the time you got to the third generation, in my practice, people were fully westernized. They were just as sick and just as overweight as any people I'd ever taken care of. So, you know, and of course the reason is, is they changed their diet. They ate rich foods like for example, at McDonald's and the first McDonald's came to Hilo Hawaii in, Hilo Hawaii in 1974. And, and I was one of their first and best customers I have to tell you folks. But it opened my eyes to First of all, I had to be a better doctor. And second of all, the way I'd been taught to eat and the way I was telling my, plant, my patients to eat was not correct because my healthiest patients ate the worst diet, at least according to, uh, to the common message. I mean, they skipped the, the meat group and the dairy group. They lived on rice and vegetables. Anyway, after three years, I left this uh, plantation pack practice. I went back into training at the Queens Medical Center. What had happened is they developed the John Burns School of Medicine. And uh, I went into a very high powered internal medicine residency program, which I finished in a little over two years and I became a board certified internist. Well, during my residency practice, uh, George McGovern of South Dakota did something really remarkable with the Congress. What he did is he put together a report which was so supposed to be uh, similar to what, uh, uh, what the Surgeon General did for smoking. And the Surgeon General for smoking back in 1964 told the public that smoking tobacco caused cancer and heart disease and all kinds of problems. He wanted to do the same thing with food. And so they put together the dietary goals for the United States, goals for the United States in 1977, in early 1977. Unfortunately, lobbying from the dairy and the meat and the other food industries changed these goals completely by the end of 1977. But while they were originally developed, what they said in the dietary goals is it proves that the major causes of death and dis this is 1977 folks proves the major causes of death and disability in the United States are related to the diet we eat. That's what Mark Hegstead of Harvard said in his testimony. The question to be asked therefore is not why should we change our diet, but why not? There's no harm, you know, it reduces costs. Why not? Why don't we change our diet? We cannot afford to temporize. We have an obligation to inform the public to do less is to avoid our responsibilities. This was 1977. And the government has an important role to play. I know a lot of people don't feel like the government should be involved in, in our lives, but I consider there are certain things that the government has to do. 
individuals or companies can't put together an army to defend us from foreign threats, can they? And the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry and the hospital industries, they're so big that an individual or a company can't take them on. It's the government's responsibility to protect us. Well, they've been semi-effective, but industry, they fight back. And like, for example, the Washington Dairy Products Commission, they got together with the American Medical Association and they put out a message. Granted, it was a while back uh, that the anti-fat, anti-cholesterol fat is not just foolish and futile, however, it also carries risks. And the industry was not happy about the, the dietary goals of the United States and they fought back. Uh, one of my other important mentors, and by the way, if you wanna learn more about Dennis Burkett, the previous mentor I talked to you about, you can go to my January, 2013 newsletter and you'll find an hour long interview of Dennis Burkett. It's the only interview that I know that exists. And if you go to my February, 2013 newsletter, you can watch an hour long interview that I did with Nathan Pritikin. It's the only interview of him on video that exists. And I had the foresight as a young man to put these, these very important people on videotape. Now, Nathan Pritikin has many books, many national best-selling books. He really changed the way the world thinks about food. He's one of my most important mentors. And he wrote a paper called High Carbohydrate Diets Maligned and Misunderstood. It's classic. It's on my website, drbickdougall.com. And also I was able to get a hold of his basic research of 500 page document. Only 50 copies were ever published. And as far as I know, only one existed. It doesn't exist anymore. It only exists uh, on the internet. It's available for you on the website. You can learn all about Nathan Pritikin and the important work that he did. I developed a rather serious coronary insufficiency, if you know that was heart disease, mm -hmm. uh, when I was 40, back in 1955. But I was convinced I had to change my diet before I developed the problem. And that was before it became symptomatic, which it didn't. No, I did. But I was thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember two or three years, by the early 50s, I was convinced there was no question about what I had to do. My cholesterol was running about 300 in those days. And, but my doctors kept telling me it's in the high normal range, don't worry about it. In fact, it was so bad, if I had a patient now with the kind of test that I developed, I would let him out of the room. I didn't give up the ice cream immediately. I just gave up everything. I just completely switched my whole diet to that of them, but i And they were your model because nobody else was around to tell you what to do. Worse than that, everyone was around told me not to do it. He said it didn't make any difference. And if you did it, were there any risks? Did they tell you? Oh, yes. Risks of malnutrition. And uh, he um, did have very serious heart disease. Uh, he was diagnosed with asymptomatic coronary insufficiency. He had a cholesterol in the two, 300 range. When he started out, when he changed his diet, of course, his cholesterol dropped as it should have and does down to the 150 milligram per deciliter or less range. When I saw what happened after the war and I began to see that it was only the fat and cholesterol that seemed to have made the difference, I then started to investigate countries around the world that were on a very low fat and cholesterol diet. In fact, I looked at the range of the world's population. I picked out countries on the very lowest fat and cholesterol intake. And I was amazed to find and there were 25 populations I was able to study that heart disease practically didn't exist. And no heart attacks in the country? No, unheard of. We couldn't find the case to show the medical student. It's amazing. And not only heart disease, but diabetes, hypertension, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, arthritis, glaucoma. That's all I treat as a doctor. <laughs> Where are all these diseases? Uh, and these were uh, under hundreds of millions of people. And here I thought these were the natural and inevitable consequence of aging and that everybody has to die of one of these diseases. And now I find that populations don't die of those. They actually die of old age, which is unheard of in this country. And uh, some of the best, best data that tells us the impact of diet comes in times of 
of serious distress, like for example, in Western Europe. Uh, it was studied uh, the incidence of various diseases, for example, and this particular graph, what we see is the mortality from diabetes in England and Wales. Uh, prior to World War I, the, the risk of dying of diabetes was increasing. And then we have the war come along, World War I, and there was a severe food restriction, and it dropped drastically. And then after World War I, good times returned again. And the incidence of diseases, not just diabetes, but multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, heart attacks, uh, obesity, et cetera. I mean, all these diseases showed the same type of curve. And then World War II came along and, I mean, you know, people say that these diseases like heart disease are, and cancer are due to stress. I mean, think about it. what could be more stressful than being in a, a situation like they were in Western Europe where uh, people were killing you and locking you up and exterminating you, separating you from your family. How much more stress could you have? And yet the incidence of disease dropped drastically because they had to ration all of the, the animal foods. Could you explain a little bit about the diet that you use for people, what it consists of? Yes, uh, a whole grain diet in which you use a lot of pasta dishes, spaghetti, lasagna, pizza, made to our recipes, of course. Uh, the noodle dishes are brown rice, of course, and all the brown rice kinds of dishes you can make. Um, and corn, uh, corn is a very popular way to handle things because you make tortillas, a lot of things that uh, uh, Mexico dishes that we have incorporated. And then the other grains, uh, millet and so on has been popular in Eastern countries. There uh, are many, many entrees that we have, but they're very versatile because we take any foreign cuisine and translate them into our kind of menu. Uh, Nathan Pritikin visited Hawaii on two occasions and he spent some time with us. On one occasion, we had a potluck dinner at our, uh, at, at the Kaneohe Yacht Club where we kept our sailboat. And we had about uh, 225 of our followers show up and bring various dishes. And Mr. Pritikin was so excited about the way they tasted. Now, this is important if you understand that the Pritikin food that was served as center was described kindly as being bland, you know, tasteless, difficult to say the least. Well, as we uh, finished our potluck dinner, we walked he and his wife out to their car and Mary handed him a hundred of her recipes and said, I I'd like you to use these. And so he did in his next book, The Pretty Good Promise, 28 Days to a Longer, Healthier Life. And you can see in the acknowledgements, the first acknowledgement is to John and Mary McDougal. Shouldn't have been, should have been to Mary McDougal because she changed the way the Pretty Good food tastes from that day on. So is the Pretty Good diet a healthy diet? It's a near vegetarian diet and there's no risk of calcium deficiency. And what, let's see what Mr. Pretty Good has to say about calcium deficiency. First of all, on calcium, the World Health Organization, that's part of the United Nations, is given the task of getting together cases of calcium deficiency uh, so they can report it in one of the conferences. They're very embarrassed when the conference came up, and here's what their report was. We're sorry to advise you, we can't find one case of calcium deficiency in the entire world's literature. That's the last thing we have to worry about is calcium deficiency. Seems like a whole industry is based on advertising their product. We certainly are. Uh, why does the United States have the highest calcium requirement in the entire world, 800 milligrams a day minimum? Why is it that the World Health Organization only requires 400 milligrams of calcium a day? Why is it that a band of two women that has nine children during their lifetime and breastfeeds two years at a time only needs 350 milligrams of calcium a day? It's because we have what we call the National Dairy Council in our country. That's why we had such a high requirement. These Bantu women, and women as I remember, are very healthy. They have all their teeth and they have right. very strong bones. Very strong bones. And more than that, the reason they retain all their calcium is because they're on a low protein diet. So protein has something to do with calcium? It certainly has. If you take more than 16% of your calories and protein, you're going to negative calcium balance. That is, you'll spill more calcium out through your urine you know, take in my mouth, even if you drink two quarts of milk a day. 
And uh, so it is. Uh, some of the best evidence that uh, what we eat causes uh, bone disease, osteoporosis, comes from uh, worldwide data. If you plot the intake of calcium worldwide with the risk of getting hip fractures, which is the most serious kind of fracture that you can get, they're deadly, what you find is a straight line correlation. The more calcium consumed in a population, the more hip fractures. Now, how can that be? It can only be as if calcium has little to do in terms of dairy products or calcium supplements, little to do with bone strength, or you might even come to the conclusion that consuming dairy products is harmful to the bones. And I think that's a conclusion you can come to fairly accurately. Uh, the correlation that really makes a difference, as Mr. Pritikin told us, was the correlation of animal protein intake and hip fractures worldwide. The uh, more protein consumed, the more hip fractures. You see places like Papua New Guinea, where 90% of their diet comes from sweet potato leaves and roots, and uh, three to 5% of their calories are in the form of protein. They have virtually no, no fractures, no osteoporosis at all. Eurasian countries, likewise, uh, based on rice diets. They have very, very few fractures, but as you move up the, the, uh, the wealth levels in terms of populations of people and the richness of their diet, you see a increase in the fracture rate because what happens is excess protein causes fractures. It causes the bones to be weak. Animal foods are made of lots of proteins. Uh, proteins are made of amino acids. So the more protein you have in your diet, the more amino acids you have in your diet. And animal foods have a particular acidic kind of amino acid called sulfuric acid. The methionine and cysteine break down to sulfuric acid, which is a very potent acid. So you end up taking in this acid load when you eat the rich Western diet. When you eat cheese, poultry, eggs, meat, seafood, you take in an acid load and, and the body has to maintain its pH perfectly at about 7.4. And so you have to neutralize the acid that you eat. And the bones are the primary buffering system of the body. So the bones dissolve and they become weak and they fracture. And the bone material ends up in the kidneys and it creates calcium based kidney stones. Your fruits and vegetables and uh, well, your fruits and vegetables are alkaline. Here you can take a look at what we call the, uh, the acid load of a diet, of a particular food. And you see that uh, cheese is the most acidic of all foods that people commonly consume with an acid load of 10. Fish, 9.3, chicken, 7.0, beef, 6.3. Yeah, you know, people will tell you that you shouldn't eat a vegan diet or shouldn't eat uh, legumes or, or grains, or wheat, et cetera, rice even because uh, it's acidic. Well, compared to what? It's acid load is one. You know, cheese is 10 times as acidic. The body can handle the mild acid load that is presented to it through some beans and some grains. The other uh, part of our diet, which is dominant, is uh, alkaline foods like potatoes are minus five, which means they're alkaline, and spinach is minus 56. Overall, the McDougall diet or any healthy diet is alkaline. So when you make minestrone soup, yeah, you might put some beans in and some grains in, but you, you put tomatoes in and you put spinach in and it turns out to be alkaline. Yeah, an alkaline diet. So uh, is the uh, pretty good diet healthy in terms of protein? It's impossible to have inadequate protein if you eat enough calories and maintain your weight. You couldn't design a diet low enough in protein to get yourself in a protein deficiency. Even if you're a skilled dietitian, you have a real tough time. Yet it seems that almost every time you speak or make a statement, there's a dietitian or some other expert who turns around and says that uh, you can't get enough protein or possibly enough calcium in the diet or all the amino acids. Why does this type of information keep getting stated? You, you find this hard to believe. But I'm faced with people saying vegetable proteins are an incomplete protein. And I say, what does it mean to be an incomplete protein? They say, well, it doesn't have all its amino acids. Yet every vegetable protein ever analyzed has every amino acid known to man. If a protein really wants to find one without its amino acids, I can point out two of you and they're both animal proteins. Gelatin doesn't have all its amino acids. 
albumin from egg white, the white of egg doesn't have all its amino acids. They're still good proteins, but you can't criticize vegetable proteins because they have every amino acid. And um, I did some calculations that I put in the book, The McDougall Plan, back in 1983, uh, clearly showing that all your plant foods contain sufficient amino acids. And this is based on William Rose's work, where he demonstrated that every single vegetable food exceeds the recommended requirement, which is twice the minimum requirement, which is the maximum any, any subject in his experiments required. You can't do it. You can't, unless you have a synthetic diet, you cannot make a diet that's, you know this, because you don't have any friends with protein deficiency. You don't have any friends with calcium deficiency now that you understand that weak bones are due to an excess of protein, not a deficiency of calcium. You have a lot of controversy surrounding you and a lot of people uh, uh, would like to see you fail, I think. There's no question about that. You are sort of a lone person standing up there giving a different message for people to follow and you have quite a following. I'm not alone anymore. I think if I would disappear from the earth today, the movement would grow and uh, it's, it's too late to stop it. Well, if, I, if I'm doing the math right, it's been 40 years, folks. It's been 40 years and, and nothing's really happened. Well, there are a few more vegans, a few more vegetarians, but the worldwide, we're in worse shape than we ever were. Uh, Nathan Pritikin, when he died, remember he at 40 years old had a serious heart disease. He couldn't run on a treadmill. And when he died, uh, they did a very thorough autopsy on him and they reported it in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they found that he had no heart attacks and he had no atherosclerosis. And complete absence of atherosclerosis was unusual to find in a man his age, you know, proving that this is a reversible disease, at least in this one case example. Uh, one of my other important mentors is uh, Walter Kempner, who did the rice diet at Duke University. He's my third most important mentor. He's the medical doctor that taught me how powerful a simple diet can be and how nutritionally adequate a simple diet can be. He served his patients, thousands of patients, that went through Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, thousands. He served them a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugar, and they thrived. If you wanna learn about Walter Kempner, uh, this is a biography written about him that is interesting. It talks about his experiments, but you can go to, to my website and you can read a lot about what I wrote about Walter Kempner in my December 2013 newsletter. And on the website, I have Walter Kempner's research. As far as I know, these are the only copies available. I was able to get a hold of two volumes of his, of his basic research and copy it. And I put it on the website for you to read for free effortlessly. And I wanna tell you, unless you have read the work of Nathan Pritikin and Walter Kempner and understand how they practice diet therapy. I'm not going to talk to you. You know, there are a lot of people who think that they have discovered a new way of eating and that the things that have been taught in the past are inadequate, ineffective, maybe even downright dangerous. Excuse me, you haven't read the research from the past. And uh, Walter Kempner and Nathan Pritikin are two that you must become familiar with or we don't even bother talking. And then the uh, fourth mentor that I would like to give a lot of credit to is Roy Swank, MD, head of neurology from Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland for 23 years, published 176 papers, showed that multiple sclerosis could be stopped with a healthy diet. And he wrote back in 1959, he wrote gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases have been linked in the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying to dig your grave with your teeth probably has its origins in antiquity. But in the prosperous areas of the Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. That's 1959. How long do we have to know the truth? Uh, 1988, as we move along, uh, Sierra Coop, 
He uh, wrote a report which was somewhat to mimic the report from the Surgeon General on smoking and health. And in there, he said that we must reduce fat, especially from animal sources and cholesterol. And of course, you know, any significant amount of cholesterol only comes from animals. The uh, United States Department of Agriculture is an organization that is supposed to help Americans decide on what to eat to become healthy, to be a now healthy nation. That's part of their responsibility. But they also have a responsibility to agribusiness. And almost always does agribusiness win out. And so the dairy, the fish, the beef, the pork, you know, these industries are the ones that dominate and end up writing the dietary guidelines for the United States after the dietary goals in 1977. The United States Department of Agriculture started uh, publishing every five years the dietary guidelines for the United States and they were heavily dominated by industry. In, the, in these guidelines, for example, I told you that they got a hold of the nomenclature. You know, they don't use the word starch. Uh, they talk about fruits and vegetables, but when they talk about the harmful aspects of food, they don't talk about meat, dairy, and eggs. They call it saturated fats and cholesterols. Again, words that you cannot relate to on your dinner plate. They purposely change the language. In 2010, some progress was made. Uh, they, they recognized the DASH diet, which is a more mm, vegetable-based diet, the Mediterranean diet, which is heavy in olives and nuts. Uh, but again, a lot more vegetable diet. The Mediterranean diet is healthy in spite of the nuts and olive oil and the animal products that are present in that diet. So fruits and vegetables, and they even recognize vegetarian diets and even vegan diets in the 2010 guidelines. But 2020, the ninth edition, nah, I think they've slipped backwards. Uh, they really don't put any emphasis on switching to a plant food based diet. What they do is they, they heavily recommend that you be careful eating a vegetarian or vegan diet. You be careful that you'll have trouble getting B12, iron, choline, zinc, iodine, and you know, your fish fats, so to speak. Well, I'm here to tell you that the only criticism that they hold that has any, any scientific relevance at all is the B12 one. And as you know, I recommend that you take a supplement of B12 if you're on the McDougal diet. But you can't criticize a plant food based diet based upon the other issues that they brought up. But they did it. And the reason they did it is because of the influence of industry. Uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, good friends of ours, they put out a dietary guidelines to match the ones of 20, 2020. And uh, they recommended that these guidelines do not include low carbohydrate eating patterns They're recommending lim limiting consumption of, of starches. Uh, they recommend water instead of milk. And they warn against consuming red and processed meats and uh, that we continue to to promote plant foods. That, that's the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a very res progressive organization, no, known for their animal rights issues, their vegan, their vegetarian issues. Well, uh, they aren't the originals to make the same, the same recommendations. Uh, the Canadians did it in 2019. The Canadian guidelines, they decided they weren't gonna take industry's message with any greater weight than the general public. And so they put together their dietary guidelines based upon all kinds of opinions. And your opinion counted. And as a result, uh, they recommend against eating animal products and they recommend for eating more plant products. They recommend water as a beverage. They have a glass of water there, not, not, a, not a glass of milk to drink. And you can see that the animal foods that are present in their plate are minimal to say the least. Yay for the Canadians. They're way ahead of the US. Now let's talk about uh, some politicians for a minute. Let's, uh, you know, we talked about a few, we talked about McGovern. Let, let's talk about Barack Obama. Barack Obama was one of my students. Uh, he was 15 years old when he was in Puno High School where I, I taught. And uh, I, I know I had a big influence on him because after the lectures I gave, he would come up to me 
and hit me with questions for 15 minutes or half an hour. I remember this. How, how do I remember him in particular? Because he was the only black student at Punahou. All the rest of them were white or Asian. I didn't forget this man. They called him Barry, Barry Obama back then. Yes, they did. And he knows the difference. After all, he was born in Hawaii where you had experiences like I talked to you about on the sugar plantation. He spent several years in Indonesia where 98% of the diet was plant foods. And he spent some time in Kenya with his dad where they eat a high starch diet, plenty of corn, root vegetables, etc. The man has the basic knowledge. A young lady in the t-shirt right there. Deacon Thank Outreach. Deacon Outreach. Woo! Thank you, Senator, very much for your strong environmental position. Where, where are you? Anyway, okay. The United Nations actually has reiterated that factory farming and including affordability of greenhouse gas emissions with all of transportation. So I think as a global community, we really need to be the leader and moving more towards non-factory farming for agriculture. It's very egregious. There's 10 billion land animals that we are funneling our precious water and grain through, and 70% of all of our grain could help maybe feed the world's hungry. So, as the next leader of the most amazing nation in the world, how can we set the example on a more nutritional, uh, plant-based diet that's more eco-friendly and sustainable that can maintain our water resources and all of our grain? Okay, well, it's a great question. Now, now, I, I have to say, in the interest of full disclosure, that I do like a steak once in a while. I'm just, I'm just being honest. I like barbecue. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. But, but the young lady makes a very important point, and that is this: um, uh, right now, our, our food system worldwide is under enormous pressure. It's under enormous pressure. Uh, because, first of all, you've had, as a consequence of climate change, uh, you've had severe uh, changes in weather patterns. We don't fully understand what these effects are, but for example, Australia's had huge drought, which has taken a lot of crops, uh, or you know, grain production has been much lower. And supplies have tightened. You're starting to see riots around food in places like Haiti and other poor countries around the world. And what is also true is that as countries like China and India become wealthier, then they start changing their food habits. They start eating more meat, more animal. Uh, and, and, and what happens then is because it takes more grain to produce a pound of beef than uh, if they were just eating the grain, what ends up happening is, is that it puts huge pressure on food supply. Now, Americans would actually benefit from a change in diet. I don't think that, I don't think that, I don't think that that's something, I don't think that that's something that we should legislate. Uh, but I think that it is something that as part of our overall healthcare system, we should encourage. Because for example, if we reduced obesity down to the rates that existed in 1980, we would save the Medicare system a trillion dollars we would reduce diabetes rates. We would reduce heart disease. So, and, and, and so the fact that we subsidize some of these big agribusiness operations that are not necessarily producing healthy food, and we discourage or we don't subsidize farmers who are producing fruits and vegetables and small scale farming that gets produce immediately too. Uh, consumers as opposed to having it processed. The fact that we're not doing more to make sure that healthy food is in the school. All those things don't make sense. And I think it does, it is important for us to re-examine our overall food policy so that we're encouraging good habits and not bad habits. For example, you know, just making sure that there are more fruits and vegetables in school lunch programs, that would make an enormous difference 
in how our children's diets develop. That would make us healthier over the long term. It would cut our health care costs, and maybe it would help uh, people elsewhere in the world who are in less wealthy countries feed themselves as well. So it's a great question. It's important. All right. I've got time for one more question. I've, I've only got time for It's got to be a guy. It's got to be a guy. I had to be fair. Well, uh, we, we can't leave Michelle out. You know, she probably made a bigger impression than her husband Brock did when she went on The Tonight Show and she fed Jay Leno a vegan meal. Apples, baked sweet potato fries, and a vegan pizza made with eggplant, green peppers, and zucchini. I want to continue the, the progression of presidents and I don't want to leave the last two out, but need I say more than what this picture shows or this picture? You know, the nice thing I did find out about our current president is his favorite meal is uh, pasta with a red marinara sauce and I don't see any meat. So there is hope even though he's not taking a strong stand on something really important for individuals, for citizens of this country, as well as for the planet itself. So I'm still in line. I could be appointed Surgeon General. Yes, I could. I realize that I'm not going to last more than 24 hours before I become, I become a target for the, an assassin's bullet. But, you know, in 24 hours, I could do a lot. You know, recommendations that I would make to our government are to reintroduce and expand upon the 1977 dietary goals for the United States. 1977 dietary goals. Update and implement the 1988 Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. Start with insisting on truth and advertising. Provide warning labels like, warning from the Surgeon General, beef pollutes rivers, lakes, and streams. Warning from the Surgeon General, Cheese will give you a heart attack and a stroke. Just like the packages of cigarettes, they should have special warnings from the Surgeon General. I would uh, remove all prejudicial, and this means money affiliations with food industries, no more subsidies. Require Congress to stop subsidizing unhealthy farms. You know, subsidize those that grow starches and vegetables and fruits to make our country a healthier country. Place a food tax. Why not a food tax? We have a tobacco tax, we have gasoline tax. Why not a food tax? We put a food tax on unhealthy foods. Yeah, I think we should. Uh, food stamps, if we're gonna give free food away, we, not know, we don't wanna make the recipients sick. You know, in a large part, these are people who already have a difficult time in life. And we provide them food that makes their life even more difficult. It makes them overweight and sick because the government programs that offer free foods are heavy into the meat and dairy and other junk food. Stop doing that. We need to develop campaigns to feed our children proper diets, you know, schools, cartoons, all kinds of education. The, kid, the kids need to learn. Require all government programs to stop serving animal foods and unhealthy foods. That means our military, our government buildings, 
you know, our military's in, in tough shape. Over half the military is overweight. These are the men and women that are defending our country. Stop it. Require general doctors and dietitians to learn and prescribe diet therapy. Yeah, that's right. If I was in charge of government insurance programs or if I was doing a dictate over private insurance companies, I would weight heavily. Diet therapy, education, heavily. You know, we'll pay them $400 for a bypass operation and $10,000 to sit down for an hour or a week and teach people how to make, make important dietary changes. Let's, let's start rewarding those who do good in the medical business. And we need, of course, a, a, a massive advertising campaign, but we can do this. You know, we, I, I, maybe earlier in life, I didn't believe we could do this, but the way the world has changed in the last couple of years, I know we can do this. We have such a profound communication and such an interest in making the world a better place. Now, I think the time is right. We need to get out in the streets and, and start a revolution. The future is ours to create. We can learn from lessons of the past, we can. And they will give us directions for the future. Which brings me to a new website I just put up. It's uh, a website de dedicated to the climate. It's dietary therapy for planet earth. And I'd like you to visit it and write me and tell me what you think. It's at mcdougallfoundation.org because I'm looking for the future and I've had a great past. I've had the opportunity to learn some wonderful things and I wanna give proper credit to everybody who's taught me both in a positive and negative way to be the kind of doctor that I am today. I'm the luckiest doctor in the world because my patients get well. Thank you very much.